So-called City of Toronto exists because of the Toronto Purchase, also known as Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in 1805, with a final claim settlement in 2010. This territory is the subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit, to care for and share the resources around the Great Lakes in peace, which we all share the responsibility in upholding and on which grounds the colonial Canadian government has continually failed. The dish with one spoon was born in part out of the Anishinaabe concept, concept of all our relations, which is the awareness that we are connected to and reflected in all the living and non-living beings around us. The city is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples with long histories on this land. And acknowledging this is only the first step in building a practice of land stewardship, we must work to restore indigenous sovereignty and return the land back. So, to introduce our guest today, uh, we have Emma Healy, who uh, you may recognize as the author of this book called Best Young Woman Job Book. Um, beyond that, Emma Healy is the author of two books of poetry, which are called Begin With the End in Mind and Stereo Blind. Her work has been published in outlets like The Globe and Mail, where she once served as a resident poetry critic, The National Post, The LA Review of Books, The Fader, Hazlitt, The Hairpin, Raptors HQ, <laughs> Go Raps, <laughs> We the North, Joyland, Maison of C Magazine, Said the Gramophone, and more. She was also notably a guitarist in the beloved punk band Rotten Column. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming Emma Healy. How are you today, Emma? I'm so good. Thank you for asking. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. It's the least I could do. <laughs> And um, I will disclose that we're friends, first and foremost. That is true. <laughs> and mm -hmm. we're also peers and colleagues. <laughs> That's how I'm always describing our relationship. <laughs> and so I'm thrilled to be, honestly, I know I sound like I'm joking, but I'm seriously very thrilled to be talking about this book, which I just reread recently. And ha how many people have joined me in this uh, experience? Yeah, it's an incredible book. It's it just rewards rereading. It's stunningly constructed, and I personally have a lot of questions, and I'm sure you do too, which we'll get to. Um, but before we do, I understand that you are willing to read an excerpt for us. I'm gonna try. <laughs> so, these, okay, so I don't normally read sitting down like this, and I have a real urge to like recline but these chairs are very deep, and so I can't, I can't do that, so I'm gonna try. I'm gonna like, please make yourself as comfortable <laughs> as possible. <laughs> the possibility is, it's there, but it's small. Okay, so I'm gonna read um, a few little excerpts from the book. So there's kind of like a hidden chapter in the book that is comprised of these little introductions to each individual section um, and I don't normally get to sort of string them all together but I thought it might be fun to do that here to create one section out of this little fractured set of passages and the thing that's notable about these passages is that they are focused on uh, my friendship with two women one of whom is named Dara who could not be here today and the other one who is Doro this person who is sitting next to me right now I did not request to be <laughs> <laughs> mentioned <laughs> in the reading. However, I very much am grateful. Okay. So I'm going to do it. Every week, I go to the movies with Dara and Doro, my two best friends. The Cineplex is across the street from an enormous mall in the center of the city. To access it, you have to ride three separate steep escalators straight up. As you move into the heart of the building, 
You pass through a constellation of globe-shaped lights, all hung from the ceiling on different lengths of wire, each glowing and dimming at its own steady pace. It is like ascending into a cloud of jellyfish inside a dream. I like to get there early and extremely stoned, order a large popcorn with double butter, and spend a few minutes before my friends arrive contemplating the complex entanglement of art and commerce represented by the cinema. Sometimes, if they're late, I'll play 10 minutes on the Metallica pinball machine hidden in the back of the small, dingy arcade near the exit. It is one of the most forgiving machines in the city. The best part of the night is when my friends arrive, and suddenly, after being apart all week, we're together. We've been doing this for years, and still, every time, when all three of us are settled in our seats amid a crowd of strangers in the dark, there's that moment where I can feel my mind slip into a lower gear. When the movie is over, we go to a bar around the corner. It occupies two floors of a large building. The ground floor bar is moody and dark with an enormous fish, enormous fish tank, and the one upstairs is brightly lit and carpeted like a church basement. We pick our level based on our collective mood. Either way, when we sit close to the window, we are all bathed in the cinematic red neon glow of the sign outside. They have a name for us here, like the three of us are a single person. We sing it with them the same way every time. The conversation always takes the same shape, though the content varies. We've honed the structure through years of trial and error, reflection, affirmation. First, we talk about the movie. Each time, I am newly astounded at how the three of us can sit together in the same room, watching the same footage for hours, and come away with completely different impressions of what we saw and what it meant. The times when we agree feel like magic. Eventually, we turn toward our lives. One by one, we take turns describing the major events of the week, everything that's happened since the last time we met. While one person speaks, the other two watch her the same way that we watch the movie. Sometimes our interpretations match, and sometimes they diverge. We match the things that happened this week to the things like them that happened weeks before. We illuminate their common themes, make sense of ourselves for each other. It is a privilege to have your life witnessed like this, with such care and attention, to have the scattered points of you arranged into a line. One week, instead of going to the Cineplex, we see a movie Dara made with another friend of hers. The film is about distance and memory. The plot focuses on an archive of letters the filmmaker's grandmother once wrote to a famous poet, which are currently held in the library of a prestigious American university. The film's protagonist, played by Dara, travels to the university to read them and spends her time there thinking about and discussing their contents with various people. The film's relationship with reality is complex. The archive, the letters, and the grandmother are all real, but Dara is playing a fictional character who is like the filmmaker, but also not like her at all. The letters are written in a language she doesn't understand, and not all of them have been translated. For most of the film, Dara sits at a long wooden table, reading and taking sparse notes we cannot see. Sometimes, we just watch her handling paper for long, silent stretches of time. It is mesmerizing to watch someone so absorbed in her work. In one scene, she brings some of the letters into a special darkened room with an overhead projector and places them onto the glass. It's a beautiful image. The envelopes glow, the postmarks glow, the paper glows. Her hands seem almost transparent as she touches the letters, moves them across the screen. All that evidence turning realer and more dreamlike in the light. And then the last one. My two best friends are natural performers. Recently, 
Darrow was cast as the protagonist in a movie about a troubled young woman navigating the relationships in her life as she goes through a rapidly accelerating emotional breakdown. When the director asked if she thought she knew anyone who could play her best friend, she thought immediately of Doro. The movie has no actual script. Instead, the two of them build their characters' personalities with the help of the director, and then he puts them in a range of different situations where they try to do what they think the people they're playing would do. They've been filming this movie for over a year. The director keeps thinking of new situations. Dara and Doro ride in the back of a limousine, go skydiving, go to a wedding, tightrope walk around the guardrail of a terrifying bridge at night. Neither of them is allowed to get a haircut or a tattoo that might interfere with their continuity. Most of their scenes will never make the final cut. One day, they were filming a scene where their characters are driving in a car together, having a difficult conversation. Doro at the wheel, Dara in the passenger seat. The director had told them that Dara's character was supposed to feel a panic attack coming on as their conversation progressed. She was playing it well. The longer she and Doro talked, the brighter the, fl the flush that crept up her throat seemed to glow, the whiter her knuckles as she gripped the seat. She was maybe even shaking a little. Doro was impressed and a little freaked out. It wasn't until Dara started to cry that both of them realized they couldn't tell whether she was still acting. Dara could sense the pressure sitting on her chest, her breath speeding up past the point where she could reel it back in. Doro was scared, watching her, but the director was silent and the crew kept rolling and the car kept moving. They would probably stop if something was really wrong, she thought. So when Dara undid her seatbelt, opened the door and rolled out of the moving car onto the pavement, Doro yelled out her character's name, not her best friend's. She didn't want to ruin the shot. Mm. All right. Was that weird? Yeah. What? <laughs> was that weird that I did that? What? Was that <laughs> weird? That was so random. Okay, that was not <laughs> in the plans. Just kidding. That was really beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really liked hearing those sections done together that way, um, where it also just kind of struck me how you could just jump in at any point in the book and find like a microcosm of how like intricately woven all the different like characters and themes are in this story, which makes me think of a couple things. One being your background as a poet, obviously, and knowing that like your process can entail writing, which you mentioned in the book also, writing like pages and pages of te like text and ideas and then narrowing it down to this one very economical sentence. And I was just thinking about like what's it like as a poet to write a memoir and which all honestly sometimes when I was reading it I didn't I wasn't like thinking of it even as a memoir even though literally I'm in it and you're my friend and I know it's real <laughs> <laughs> I was like this is a story and it's beautiful and it's complex and I'm in school again I'm taking notes <laughs> and I'm getting smarter so I guess what I'm asking is did you feel like a poet when you were writing it or did you feel like something else did you find a new version of yourself as a writer? And also, did you set out to make a memoir? Or did you kind of start writing and were like, oh, I guess this is what it is? So the way this book came about, first of all, thank you for saying all of that. I really appreciate it. It's really nice. I don't know. It's So the way that I originally sold this book was that I had written an essay a million years ago um, that was about a particular experience that I had had of um, like sexual assault and abuse of power. And I went on the radio to talk about those things and some people who were editors at Penguin Random House um, got in touch with me and asked if I would be interested in writing a book about those things. And at first I thought, yeah, sure, I would love to do that. I um, have no money. I work at like a terrible job. Um, I write like SEO blog posts um, from my home and I'm miserable and I wanna be a real writer. I wanna be taken seriously. So I thought I will write a book of essays, serious essays. And you know, I was already publishing like opinion pieces in the newspaper sometimes. 
Um, and I had published these two books of poetry, and I thought, it's not going to be anything like the poetry I, ri I write. It's going to be just like essays, cultural commentary, trenchant, feminist insights. And then I tried to write that book, and it was an absolutely miserable experience. It was just awful. The writing was bad. It felt so forced. It was, like, embarrassing. I was like, I don't even know if this book should exist, and if it does, I don't know if I should be the person who writes it. Um, and, and so that was a really useful educational experience in, like, what I couldn't do. Um, and so that was out. And then I tried to write it like a book of poetry. I wanted to write about all these experiences and the way that, you know, power and value and language can be mediated by these experiences of, like, labor that you can have. And I wanted to write about those things through these little writing jobs that I had had and the way that, you know, content writing work can kind of merge with writing about your own life for money. And then those two things get really tangled and complicated and fucked up. And... I tried a lot of different tones at first because I was trying to write the thing that was the most marketable, I guess, which also fits in with the general set of themes that I was trying to explore. I was like, poetry is not a very, um, nobody wants to read like a, I don't know. I was trying to, at first I was trying to write just a book of poetry about it and that wasn't very good. And then I was trying to write you know, a collection of very straight ahead essays about it and that didn't work either. And eventually I found myself as I was working and reworking, like you said, I have a, a kind of circuitous process where I'll write a lot and then call one sentence and then write a lot and then do it again. And as I was doing that, I found that the, the things that I was the most drawn to were the things that didn't feel like they fit in either of those genres um, that just kind of sat tonally in their own place in this way that was like poetry that I had written before, but that wasn't like it either. Um, so I was sort of creating and refining and figuring out that tone, which felt like it sat in between all these different genres at the same time. And I, I'm really pleased with the way it turned out because I think the thing that you said about it not feeling exactly like a memoir, m maybe feeling like inflected by poetry or influenced by it, um, was really like important to me. Um, and I'm glad that that comes through when you read it. Oh yeah, it comes through so much. Like I was thinking about it the whole time I was reading. Like I can't help but think about the genre and the form throughout in the sense that I felt myself really getting so immersed in the way you were telling the story that I felt like obviously you are writing. I know the like the content themes that you're writing about and you're expressing that so clearly, but it feels so enriched by this like scaffolding underneath it that's like making me think about writing and like language and like you describe at one point like finding like a hidden language within the one you thought you knew like and you mold language for all your different purposes as you move through the narrative so it's really incredible in that sense and I was thinking about when you were reading the passages also how amazing you are at describing places and like that there's such a t like a, a map in your mind when you're reading this book, even the way you just described, like going up into the, the levels of the Young and Dundas movie theater, which maybe you have been in. It, when I read that, I was like, oh yeah, that is like going into a jellyfish or whatever. <laughs> Not that I've done that, but <laughs> I'm sure it would be similar. And, <laughs> and I was thinking, like when I was reading the book, that it's like, yeah, there's, I don't know, is it boring if I talk about, like I ask you about a specific thing that I really no, enjoyed? No, I love that. The, one of my favorite images is like this central device that functions in the book where within the memoir there's like a novel that you're working on throughout. And it, so there's like this kind of, there's you as the protagonist, but there's also the protagonist you're writing, which obviously already makes the reader so aware of that this is like a hybrid genre. But um, the protagonist discovers in the basement of their school a secret hidden subterraneous swimming pool that is also a black hole and sets out on a sort of neo-noir detective process to find someone that's been sucked into the black hole. But this black hole also obscures this fact-finding mission entirely. And 
I felt like reading the book, like that it's like that image is also the book where it's like the scaffolding of the memoir is like a building. Like we have like, you know, genre and constructs and like facts and histories, which is what memoirs are about. But you're constantly destabilizing everything with this image of like this thing running under the surface of everything, whether it's like that hidden language or this hidden spot. And you just describe it so well using this like architecture that I feel like we're inside of when we're in the book. So yeah, I'm just going off about what I like in, this, in that sense. But what did it mean for you to like destabilize the genre of memoir, especially when it is classically obsessed with factuality and, you know, yeah. What yeah. did that mean for you? How did you arrive at that? I love if, I, if I'm correctly interpreting your... Oh, you're correctly <laughs> interpreting it, my friend. You are giving it the most correct interpretation that anyone has ever given yes. of this book. <laughs> um, it, so it's interesting because there's a... There was something that I took a while to figure out, and then once I slotted into it, it felt so natural. And it's it's something that a lot of people have, have commented to me about the book, um, which is the the way that people are like named or not named in it. Um, there's a lot of people who don't get named. In fact, most of the characters in the book don't have like a proper name, um, except for you and Dara. Shout out. <laughs> Shout out to you guys. Um, <laughs> which was really important to me because you guys felt almost like co-authors of the book to me and I wanted that to be, you know, like I wanted that to be clear and differentiated from the rest of the world of the book. But I didn't really realize until it came out and people started commenting to me about it like how I guess it's not like a normal thing in a memoir to have like no person or place be given a name. Um and I think that does make it feel almost more like it gives it a, a, a more dreamlike quality that I think you see often um, like in fiction or in uh, poetry or just in like other kind of genres because I think the idea of, as you're saying, like there's something about memoir that we think of as being really grounded in like fact and like proper nouns and, and place names. Stressful to think about. Yeah, extremely. <laughs> <laughs> And I was like, I think that that was something for me that was part of the journey of figuring out like how I wanted to tell the story that I was telling, um, which felt so much to me. I don't know. I didn't think there was anything particularly interesting about the proper noun parts of my experience. I didn't think that like the name of a city where I had lived or the names of the people that I had been spending time with or, you know, I all of that felt extraneous compared to the thing that I was actually trying to get across, which was like this set of interconnected themes and ideas. And it felt almost like all that other stuff, all that like traditionally memoirish stuff yeah. was cluttery. It wasn't, it was obscuring the stuff that I actually wanted to get to. And once I cleared that away, mm -hmm. I felt like I had really arrived at something that like voice wise felt much more comfortable to me. Um, and that, you know, felt much truer to the the narrative structure, I guess, that I was trying to create. Totally. Also, like, just the fact that thematically you're, like, I almost said the character. You. <laughs> but that's, like, I love that yeah. because it's like, they're, it's kind of a little bit both. Main right? character syndrome. Yeah, exactly. She's got, got it. it. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the character, you. <laughs> oh, my God, I did it again. Um, are, like like you know like being put upon to like create like a factual account of your life within the narrative of the book and also yeah. meta narrative you're also supposed to be doing that through the memoir so i saw it as by destabilizing those things you're like making the reader think about what it means to like receive a book like this and be like Ah, the story of someone's life. When, like, you're the, like, even as the author, are, like, at various points, like, I think of the passage where you're, like, you're on the radio and you said, I believe in myself, I'm learning how to believe in myself, and then have this moment afterwards being like, I didn't say that. Did I say that? I yeah. don't know if I believe in myself. <laughs> like, these moments that are just so much realer than any, like, hard objective fact of being like, how am I supposed to 
keep such accurate track of all of these things, especially Fuck in the position yeah. of an author where I'm publishing something that then can act as like a document. Mm -hmm. So to like create these like, you know, little like insurrections that like make the text like something that is like resisting those generic conventions, I think yeah. is really cool. It's like, it's definitely, I really appreciate that insight. I feel like you just articulated something that like I definitely had in mind the whole time, but haven't like necessarily spoken out loud oh, to myself. Really? Yeah, because it's, it's, it's such a crucial part of, I mean, I think that especially like the type of content writing that I was doing that I, that I talk about doing in the book also where you're like a woman talking about trauma and you're talking about your experiences and then you're like publicly offering them up for $250 for not anyone not on enough. the internet not to enough <laughs> enough <laughs> money <laughs> for that type of thing. No. And there's like, and then what you're really doing, even as you know, you're doing a lot of other stuff personally, you're going through your own journey with it. And you know, maybe other people are receiving it and having their own like personal experiences of it that can be really valuable and cool and exciting and, and and gratifying and thrilling but also you are offering up facts like i always found it so strange that when i was writing about my own life i was gonna get like fact checked by people who had never met me or by people who had met me and who you know like i would yeah. get emails from strangers saying that doesn't sound like it really happened and you should have seen the emails i sent her <laughs> <laughs> i can't believe it oh i kept them all <laughs> No, but like, you know, you get your, like, you are in that economy, you are being asked to provide, you're being asked to provide like an accurate and moving and touching and honest and impactful account of your own emotions and experiences, but you're also being asked to provide like factual accuracy at the same time. Um, and there's like, you know, there's all kinds of people that we demand those types of narratives from, um, and we offer them very little in return. And I think that it was a very like, uh, kind of like liberating and exciting experience to f like, this is a very like factually accurate book. Um, and I, I made sure to fact check myself a lot in it. Like I, I had the wild experience of going back through like all of my old notebooks and all my old correspondence, but relieving myself of the responsibility to justify or prove or like you know account for literally everything felt um it felt like a cool way of kind of like throwing off the strictures of that like content economy type yeah. feeling just acknowledging the difficulty in that like that it's not something that is easily done to compile the facts of a life into a non-fiction or a kind of like totally accurate memoir but then it's also yeah you're you're it's being enforced at the same time. But I feel like by using water as, I mean, this is my interpretation, but like water recurs through the book, both in that pool, but also like you mentioned, this like awareness of like currents that flow under the surface, like the rivers that used to run under the sidewalks that we walk on. And like, at one point you say, if I may quote, please, <laughs> that writing about someone is like planting your flag in the sea, which is such a, beautiful image and kind of to me summarizes like your approach to this memoir where it's like acknowledging that it's like kind of a risky thing to do and it's not always stable but you're like taking this effort to write about people and write about yourself and use it as a way to you know showcase your incredible voice as a writer and how unique it is so well done thank you um, and I had another thought actually that came up when you were talk when you were reading the passage and also when in what you were just saying about how like you've thought of us as co-writers which is so interesting in relation to the passage you read and other points in the book where you you have this kind of habit of using the collective noun to talk about both like you know, you use the collective noun when you're doing your search engine optimization blogging, which is like makes sense because you're like, we love to go to the spa. We all need time to relax. Like that's obviously an, a normal way to use the collective noun. But then you also use we when you're talking about your personal experiences. 
and you create this like overlap of subjecthood between some of these disparate experiences and also like having characters speak in chorus like what did that how did you arrive at that like device of like using this collective noun and this idea of like in contrast to like the loneliness of writing which you also talk about in the book like creating this other mode of like imagining writing as something that isn't just you expanding subjecthood i love i love that <laughs> it's it's so interesting because there's like there's a couple elements to it that's like a s just in terms of language that's something that i was always really interested in in poetry too i always thought it was so interesting there's like a strange overlap linguistically between the way that like corporations speak um which is kind of always as a, a collective noun um and i always i thought that was really interesting i don't know when i would be writing for like i talk in the book about the experience of even like writing for a music festival and it's like you have to figure out how a music festival would sound if it could talk and then you have to talk in the voice of the music festival and then be it um and that that was such an interesting like that felt like poetry that felt like writing poetry more than often writing poetry felt like writing poetry because it was such a it was such a bizarre and fascinating formal exercise and then when you zoom out of it you're doing it for a company um and that also feels strange like why do we need what are the sort of like political implications behind the fact that like a, a company needs to speak to you as a collective entity <laughs> And it's like, <laughs> it's scary. Yeah, it's it's creepy, and it's got like horror movie vibes. And then it's also like it's supposed to comfort you or make you feel comfortable around them, um, and make you feel like they're not trying to do something essentially manipulative to you. Um, and I always think that that is interesting. And then at the same time, one of the most comforting experiences is to feel like you're part of a collective or part of a group or to feel as though you're sort of being folded into a larger um, like communal experience. And so often you can have that, you can have it in a group, like there's a, there's a whole sort of chunk of the book where I use that collective noun to talk about the experience of, you know, being a woman like among other people in a group who are all sort of being treated the same way, which is not very well. And it's like in that situation, I didn't, you know, you don't necessarily have a feeling of solidarity like in the moment, but when you look back on it, you think, oh, we were all having the same individual experience at the exact same time. We were a part of a group. We were like a kind of a family almost or something without even really mm -hmm. understanding that that's what we were. And then that you can also have that experience alone with yourself that when you come back to you know whether it's like like just anything i think like emotionally impactful moment in your life like the kind of thing that you would want to put in a memoir you feel like you're joining yourself in a weird way like the trauma can make you feel that way but also like happiness or joy or just like a positive experience can make you feel returned to a version of yourself that you know you hadn't experienced in a long time you feel a feeling and you remember all the times that you felt that feeling before and you feel linked to you yeah. and suddenly you're a part of this like collective experience the collective you so it's like on the one hand you are joined to your you the one entity of you becomes multiple and the multiple entities of others become one yeah which is like and, it, and you get to fuck with the grammar along yeah. the way which feels really cool totally. yeah i loved that so much when i was rereading it you would say at one point that the stories are so similar, they sound like they all happen to the same person. This kind of like, it feels like there's, yeah, there's kind of comfort in like this collective memory too, that it's not just your responsibility. Like we're all kind of brought into this collective experience of like remembering these things. And yeah, I was also thinking about when you were just talking now about being joined with yourself. That was another thing that really struck me when I was reading it around your construct of time and then I almost said the novel, I'm dead, <laughs> in the memoir, is so like interesting and I think it touches, I think those, these two ideas of the collective noun and this overlap of experience obviously are connected but 
I would like to tease out a little bit more about how you think about time in the novel, because you write exactly what you were just saying. I was thinking of another experience where you're in someone's bedroom and you say, I can taste the stale air of the office on my tongue, or I can feel the rough sheets of another under my back, or I can sense the true purpose of my life running under the surface. Like these moments where you're experience, you're feeling multiple experiences, like layer together that it made me think that like time even though in a memoir we might think of like a chronology time doesn't follow that path it works more like a stack or like a striation yes or like an overlay like a double exposure of a photograph yes. or like a layer of sediment yes. which is so interesting and i was thinking about like you know what what to you and it's almost becomes like sci-fi sort of with the, this idea of another thing happening concurrent to our reality which also brings up the idea of another realm, too. So what? why do you have this interest in non-linearity of time? Oh, man. It's so, <laughs> it's so gratifying to talk to you about this. <laughs> and also, like, I don't know, that is a really strong... I think that's something that, like, really almost to go back to your first question, like, poetry and my experience of being a poet was, I think, where I first felt like permission to see time that way I think that when you're taught how to write an essay in school or when you you know are just like learning about writing in a basic way um, you know you're you learn about time and form kind of at the same time and you learn that they're supposed to unfold in this like linear you know you go from A to B you have a journey that starts in one place and ends at another place and then your experience your lived experience of time is so different from that I don't know how you guys feel, but I don't often feel like that's how I experience time. I don't, that's not how I experience being in a body is like, I'm just constantly moving from point A to point B and point C and there's no weirdness in between and like no static and no complication. Like it's like you say, it is more of like a, like a layered experience um, of things kind of constantly doubling back and like overlapping on top of each other. And I think that that is, it's interesting because again that's something that I felt like at first when I was trying to write this like very just like essay after essay version of this book I, f I kept being tripped up by that because you are the traditional structure of a traditional essay is like you know you you move from an idea into a conclusion n you know pretty neatly with like some little pit stops on the way for insight and when I was trying to like map that onto my experience of being alive I found that like they didn't correspond at all and I felt kind of like disturbed by that at first like I was like oh no does that mean that I'm like fundamentally Something's wrong yeah I'm like busted but then it turns no. out that that I think that is like pretty I think that is something closer to and I think that's something that like poetry got me closer to understanding is that that is that is a more sort of like common I think lived experience although obviously nobody has like the exact same lived experience but it felt good to like get closer to that in the in the way that I was writing about it it was cool I think that's why we need poets because I don't I would never have thought of time that way and it struck me it's it resonates so much like I'm like yeah that is the way it, that it works but I don't think I would have conceived conceived of experiences happening in that layered way if I hadn't read your book. But it's so funny because in a way, not to whatever, but <laughs> not no to please, whatever, whatever, but I do think that there's like the reason why I put those passages with you and me and Dara at the beginning of every section of the book is because I found that like even before poetry or like outside of outside of literature and art and those ways of like conceiving of things, I feel like the the fundamental way that I came to understand like that I feel like the most practical experience of seeing time in that way that I've ever had is of having close friendships with people who read your life like it's a like it's a text or yeah. like it's a piece of art and who encourage you to see your life that way big time because they beautiful yeah you come back to stuff That's and true. you understand yourself in that way that is not the kind of forced linear way that everybody else is like making you try to shape yourself into all the time. Very true. That's a very good point. And it must have another layer of meaning to it when you're a writer and you're also like, you know, you write 
you wrote a book about the process of writing the book that we're now talking about on the <laughs> stage. It never ends. And you were writing about imagining what the reception of the book would be before the book was even received. And will this moment be in a book in the future? We don't know. Only like, time will tell. As you're experiencing things, you're also cataloging them and you're doing that like sense making work that we also do together but it's it's just very special to see it consecrated in that way where you can have someone keep a record of it because it is true that's a very special feeling when you can have the glimpse of how all of these experiences fit together in a non-linear but resonant way and I guess maybe dovetailing off of that little spiel, is there another book in the works? <laughs> you got something cooking in there? <laughs> I got something cooking in there. <laughs> in where? I'll never tell. That's a reference to the <laughs> David Cronenberg's uh, <laughs> Crimes of the Future. A movie I will not seen. watch. Yeah. <laughs> Too scary for me. Um, Respect. Yeah, I got like a, I kind of want to write a novel that is Woo. yeah i don't know i don't know Cheers if i for can that do it form <laughs> we love it we do love the novel you can't you can't get away from it in <laughs> many ways as you know i think this is a novel <laughs> <laughs> so you're halfway there yeah i hope so <laughs> i do you think this is just something i'm just thinking of right now but do you think you would ever okay was the novel idea within the book actually an idea that you've been thinking about and would you ever make that novel or is that more just like a device that you were using to tell this story i think that okay the reason why the novel was interesting to me to include in the book i mean there's lots of reasons obviously and i think you touched on some of them but i think that there's i think to me really interested in how much the the border between this is going to sound really broad when i say it but just the 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 difference between fiction and nonfiction is always dissolving a little bit more and more oh in yeah. my mind. And like the difference between like the protagonist and the narrator and you and the writer and the collector of information and then and the, the reader and the reader which you have brought my attention to yeah. with this collective noun stuff. Yeah. Like, you know, that all of that stuff, the distinction between those things feels a bit, I don't know. It's like, again, everything is mediated by capitalism. Like the reason why, you need to categorize a book in a certain way so that you can know where to put it in the store, right? Like, aside from that, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of think that that is, that's where I'm heading with that, is like the novel that I want to write, it's, it's definitely associated with the novel that's described in that book, but the novel that's described in the book is constantly evolving and shifting as my life evolves and shifts because the protagonist in it is so related to me. Mm -hmm. um, and they all kind of like merge into a single text, yeah. which is also my experience of being alive. Does so it I think it'll be, you know, connected to it in that way. Yeah. I just want to quickly check. Are we at, w we're at maybe like 15 minutes? 15 minutes. Oh, I love that. Thank you. Thank you. Right on. Yeah. Hell yeah. Um, do you f think differently about like, writing about yourself and writing about people in your life when it comes to writing a novel? Like, do you think that'll still be a part of the process and will it look different or would, do you think it'll have some similarity to writing about your life in a memoir? I think, okay, so lately I've been thinking about, um, like there's something that I want to say in response to that and I feel like it's going to sound very like, oh shucks, like I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think this is an aw shucks safe <laughs> environment. <laughs> I don't necessarily always think of myself as like a particularly imaginative writer. Like, and I, I don't think that's a bad thing. Oh, uh, but like, you know, I think that if you say that, if you're like, I don't know if I have much imagination or like, or, or skill and talent in that department, I think people are going <laughs> to think that you're being like self deprecating. I think I have skills, but I don't think that like inventing things out of thin air is my skill. Which you talk about in this book. It's true. I do you buy the book you can hear <laughs> all about it but i think that it's i think that my my skill lies more in like interpreting and arranging and that took me a while to um accept about myself because i kind of thought for a long time that to be a writer you had to be good at like inventing stories and you know conjuring a plot and like 
I really respect and admire people who can do that in the same way that I really respect and admire like poets for whom poetry is like a really comfortable place and they don't ever want to go outside the genre or that they find they they feel comfortable enough there that they don't feel the like the desire to kind of constantly be like striking out and doing other things. I don't necessarily feel at home in a single genre and I don't necessarily feel comfortable um yeah, just like making stuff up. I think that <laughs> too honest for all that. <laughs> yeah, that's my problem. I'm too I honest. I cannot tell a lie. Yeah. I'm a Healy. <laughs> <laughs> but I just, you know, I think that I I think that um whatever I write, no matter what like genre it's it's supposed to be in, is always going to have, I think, um it's always gonna be like influenced and kind of like faceted by my life experience. And it's always the you know the characters are always going to have a relationship to people in my life. Mm-hmm. It would be nice to write with a bit more like freedom though. Like I did find that I was so I was so like focused on being rigorous about the like factual accuracy of this book that it would be nice to be able to go on some like flights of fancy. Totally, especially because even though you were rigorous about factuality, you do clearly draw. You do clearly dissolve the line. That's what makes this book so, there's such a tension that's so interesting because you are dissolving the line between fact and fiction at the same time as you necessarily need to convince yourself and the reader and the people in your life that things are true. So it's like there's an unresolvable tension that's really interesting. So oh it would yeah. be cool to see how that would, how you could maybe spread your wings a little bit in, in a fiction. I love that. Thank you. I think we're coming to the time of the day where we might, if you're willing, oh, ask the audience to participate. You guys all have to get up and clap. Yeah, I was going to say and do a dance. So there's a when I say, (laughs) just kidding, (laughs) Emma, you say Healy. Okay, we have time for we have about ten minutes, so we could ask. We have if if anybody has a question, we could probably have a couple cues to A up here. Anyone brave enough to start us off? Don't be shy. I I simply never do in this yes, situation, so I'm not judging. <laughs> the question I'll just repeat it quickly was you were asking about writing about people in your life and that's you know interesting conceptually but was it ever weird like did anybody come up to you and be like what was that <laughs> <laughs> is that right <laughs> okay <laughs> so definitely a complicated experience to like I mean writing about people that you don't necessarily care what their opinion about it is going to be is so much easier because you don't it's just you write about what you remember and what you experienced and then if you don't even know if they're ever going to see it again and that's great so you don't have to worry about it but the people you love representing the experiences (laughs) of the people who are important to you or your experiences with them is like yeah it's like a fraught and really freaky experience i had a lot of stress about it in the early parts of writing the book I promised myself that I would turn that part of my brain off to the best of my ability while I was working on it. You can always edit stuff out or delete stuff. And what I really tried very hard to do was to never, never like claim to be representing anyone's experience um, besides my own. So like you see people and you talk to people and they tell you stories. And like obviously like in the parts where I like relayed a story that you had told me, like I would check. Um, But I tried really hard to only talk about either what other people had told me directly and that I felt like they would be comfortable with or, um, you know, to only talk about, like, how I saw their experiences. So to never, like, say that I knew what was going on in someone else's mind or what their, like, internal experience was. Except for um, my mom is here. You can talk to her about (laughs) it probably because I think she had the most complicated experience of anyone who was written about in the book because in order to kind of like go over to to set some context I did have to repeat stories that she had told me and stuff that I wasn't there for um and I know that's gotta feel weird 
um, but she was incredibly gracious about it and really kind about it. And also, I did try and like you know fact check as much as I could early on, um, you know, in the in the late stages of the editing process, but early enough that I could change something if if anyone really wanted me to. But I did feel like a real sense of obligation to not um, misrepresent anybody. Um, and I think the best way to do that is to just hew as close to your own lived experience as possible. Thank Definitely you so much. Definitely freaky, yeah. <laughs> nice. We got a Q. Love it. Oh, we got a C. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it very, very short. Don't worry. Um, I just wanted to say I had, I did have questions about um, proper nouns, so I'm really glad that the conversation went in that direction because it definitely answered those questions for me. So my C <laughs> is that um, the effect that it had on me reading it yeah. was that like I was really engaged with those places that you were describing. I was like, oh my god, she's talking about the Imperial Pub or mm -hmm. shout out the Imperial Pub. <laughs> Ontario Woo! or whatever. We love it. Um, but also, um, I think that the the stuff around like Can Lit's Me Too reckoning was like it was it put me in that place too. So while I was reading what you were, what you had written, I was also reflecting on my own thoughts at the time. So mm -hmm. it was very effective. So I just oh wanted man. to let you know, like, thank I, you. I felt like oh, we could be friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What have you? So yes, thank I really you, thank appreciate you. that. Thank you. I love that comment. Yeah, yeah, me too. I agree. It's, you know, I think it was sort of the other thing that I didn't necessarily anticipate when I was writing it, but that I've heard from a lot of people since it came out that like, the not naming. It's like if people don't know anything about like people who don't live in Toronto, people who didn't experience these things, people who aren't like in our community, um, can read it, and you don't need to know anything about those things. Tried to provide like as much context as you would need, or as much of a like an understanding as you just need to jump off and and see what's going on. But then it's like a little special Easter egg for people who do know yeah. the places that you're talking about or whatever. And it allows me as a reader to focus on your beautiful description of the place that then is not as bogged down by the my exact memory yes. of it, like you were saying. Yes. Yeah. So I thought, it, yeah, I also agree it functioned very well. Thank you. We must be closing in on our time together here. We got five whole minutes? Oh, yeah. All right, let's get one more question rolling out there. Anyone or a comment, or that's the only two Those options. are the only two types. Maybe. Oh, we got one in the front here from uh -oh. some guy. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, can we? Hello. Just hello. <laughs> <laughs> this is my husband, everyone. <laughs> A lucky man. I am. Um, <laughs> oh God! I wanted to ask about uh, the structure in terms of uh, the sort of uh, jobs you talk about uh, throughout the book, and how it creates a bit of an episodic or sort of modular loop within the book. And I was wondering if you could kind of touch on that in terms of structure and your thoughts about structure in this wonderful book. Yeah, it's funny because like I feel like everything that we've been talking about is like a like a narrative or thematic structure. Yeah. And then there's also this other structure that is sort of like imposed on the book that almost doesn't feel like it's funny because when I pitched it, I feel like the the way I sold this book before it was anything was I said it's going to be a a series of stories that like, you know, goes all the way through my 20s and all these weird jobs that I had, all these wacky jobs that I had kind of thing. And you know, that's like a very easy and straightforward way of describing it that I think the book ended up being, it's it's an organizing principle, but it feels almost like incidental compared to these other like mm. themes that kind of flow through it, but it, it does sort of give it a way, a way that you can kind of move through. It's sort of the most linear time that you get in the book is going from one job to the next job. And I think what's funny about it is that they all have, they provide also that weird balance of there's like concrete details um, of, you know, each one, there's people, there's places, there's stories. It's a place to situate all these different like narrative and, and, and thematic ideas. But they all also have like a, when you look at them all in a row like that, they all have a kind of surreal, dreamy structure to them. They're each weird in their own way. They each feel like I made them up a little bit when I'm like thinking about them now. They each have their own little environment, cast of characters, relationship with language, relationship with money, 
um, like folded into them. And so they're a really neat little lens through which you can view all these other things. They're like a prism through which all the other like sort of themes and ideas get like refracted a little bit. Yeah. And that's what makes the book genius to me is that it works on so many levels. Like you can approach it that way and be like, oh, what an interesting little tale. But then every element also connects to those deeper themes and motifs. Or if you're like me, you can just choose to get lost in the swimming pool underneath it all and not even think about, <laughs> just kidding, I <laughs> did still think about <laughs> what happened. But yeah, there's a lot of entry points and, and yet everything is so interconnected such that no narrative element is detached from the way that you in mess with the form or the genre. Everything is so connected and it's, that's what makes it, among many other things, such a rewarding book to read. So I highly recommend reading it. Thank you. And with that, I guess we'll have to say goodbye. This was a really wonderful time yeah. for me. I hope it was for you oh, and for the yeah. audience. And on behalf of the Word on the Street Festival, I would like to say congratulations on your book. Oh my God, thank you. And thank you for being here. And I would like to say thank you for being here and attending this event at the Great Book Stage. Up next is Ripple Effect, a conversation with Genevieve Graham, Anne Lazurko, and Amita Parikh, moderated by Rachel McMillan. Thank and you guys uh, yeah. so much. Anything you want to say as a last word? No. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Oh, uh, yes. we will be having uh, yes. a book signing. Yes. So I'm please come sign. say hi. Yeah, just down there. Down I don't that actually, way. I don't actually know where I'm doing it, but it's down that Follow way. Follow us. 